This is Duke University. Great. Well, welcome uh, to all of you who, who have come. We have a number of distinguished panelists. We also have me. And as uh, my former boss, the, the former provost of the university, said to me just a few seconds ago, he said, this is going to be a good panel. I hope you don't say much. So I will do my best <laughs> to, uh, to honor Peter Lang's uh, instructions. Uh, we're fortunate to have with us uh, Professor Hadian, who is on my right. He's a professor in the Faculty of Law and Political Science at the University of Tehran. Uh, but he is no uh, stranger to us here in America. He received his PhD from the University of Tennessee. And he has had a number of dis uh, distinguished visiting fellowships here in the United States. And so we are very uh, grateful for you to come and to share your perspectives. We also have with us our Duke's own Mark Emmelian, who is a senior research and development engineer in the Duke Physics Department. And so between the two of them, we will get uh, different perspectives, uh, but perhaps overlapping perspectives on the meaning of the nuclear deal. And then I'll offer some comments broadening out to uh, the implications for uh, the, the broader regional strategy. And then we will open it up for Q&A uh, from the audience. Um, now, I want to remind everyone that this has uh, been sponsored by pretty much every organization at Duke. Uh, this, is a, <laughs> this is a grand coalition of the willing, but I think uh, pride of place goes to DISC. Uh, and thank you, Omid, for uh, pulling this together and then pulling the rest of us. Uh, but it's also sponsored by the Sanford School of Public Policy, uh, the Duke University Physics Department, the Political Science Department, and the American Grand Strategy Program. So without further ado, I'm going to ask Mark if you would start uh, with your presentation. Thank you, Peter. I'm honored to be here. Thank you all for uh, attending. Um, so my talk consists of two sections, um, a brief timeline, I should say, uh, of the Iranian nuclear uh, program uh, from its uh, start to uh, roughly uh, the end of Pahlavi regime and the first few years of the uh, Islamic Republic. And I'll try to be brief, I uh, understand the uh, 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 time issue here. And then the second uh, part would be some technical aspect of uh, nuclear enrichment, uh, uranium enrichment. I've been often asked, uh, since I work with physics, uh, these questions, uh, you know, what is a fissile, or uh, how do you enrich uh, uh, uranium. So for that, we need to go back to December 8, 1953, when um, uh, President Eisenhower um, launches the uh, U.S. Atoms for Peace Initiative in a speech at the U.N. General Assembly. Um, as part of that program, uh, U.S. supplied uh, research reactors and highly enriched uranium to uh, 43 countries, including Iran, Israel, and uh, South Africa. So um, in 1957, uh, US and Iran um, signed a civil nuclear cooperation agreement. In 1967, uh, Tehran uh, Nuclear Research Center opens a five megawatt uh, nuclear reactor fueled by uh, U.S. supplied uh, high, highly enriched uranium. Incidentally, uh, uh, I uh, had an opportunity uh, to work there briefly during uh, my college years uh, in Iran. Uh, I was a college student uh, in Tehran and lived actually not too far from that uh, facility. In 1968, uh, Iran signs the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. 1970, uh, Iran is allowed to enrich uh, uranium at their own um, nuclear lab facilities. In 1974, Iran signs the uh, NPT's safeguard agreement with the IAEA. And 1975, Siemens initiates uh, construction of two nuclear reactors 
at the uh, uh, port city of Boucher by the Persian Gulf. And these uh, are with the capacity of 1,200 uh, uh, megawatt. In 1978, in January, Iran agrees uh, to safeguards beyond NPT requirements. In return, the U.S. grants uh, Iran most favored uh, uh, nation status. Ironically, we know what happened in 1978 and early 1979. Um, as I was there myself, millions of uh, Iranians poured in cities in Tehran, Isfahan, Tabriz, and um, that, of course, culminated with the revolution of uh, uh, Islamic Republic in February of 1979. So, uh, two more here uh, in March, well, uh, in 1979, uh, U.S. halts all supplies of highly enriched uranium for the Tehran nuclear research reactor. And, of course, Siemens uh, pulls out uh, and terminates the, the, uh, the project that they had in Boucher. 1984, um, in March, Iraq launches air attack on Boucher nuclear power plants. In December of the same year, Iran opens a nuclear uh, research facility in Isfahan. Uh, 1987, Argentina signs a deal to supply a new core for the Tehran uh, uh, research, research reactor. And uh, 93, Argentina, Argentina delivers 50 pounds of uh, highly 20% enriched uranium to Tehran. So um, I'm going to end here. Uh, unfortunately, we do not have the capability of showing the slides. I have some more, but um, what I would like to do, go to the second section, uh, which is essentially the technicality and the engineering behind how to uh, enrich uranium. Uh, in Iran, there are two uh, uranium uh, mines. One is near Yazd, city of Yazd, which is right in the center of, of Iran, called Sarand. And one actually very close to Bandar Abbas, the port city, uh, right by the Strait of Hormuz. It's called Bichin. So to extract uranium, actually, the uh, basic principle as extracting gold, silver, uh, other metals, uh, essentially with the different uh, chemicals. So um, you extract uranium from mine and convert this to a powdery, yellowy uh, substance called yellow cake, which is actually very, very powdery. And that's uh, uranium oxide. Uh, now, from uranium oxide, uh, with a whole bunch of chemical processes, uh, you would, one would create uh, uranium hexafluoride, uh, UF6. And uh, the UF6 contains both uranium-238 and uranium-235. And we all know that it's the uranium-235 that can be used for, uh, for the fissile. Now, the key here is that uranium-235, it's only 0.7% of that gas. The rest, which is 99.2% or so, is uranium-238, which um, cannot be used for efficient um, nuclear reactor or, or, or weapon. So there are uh, a few methods of extracting. Well, I should, well, one should say that um, for nuclear reactors, you would use um, up to about 5% or so enrichment. For medicine, about 20%. And for weapons, about 90%. So getting 
uranium, which is 0.7% to 90%, that, of course, poses a challenge, a uh, uh, technical challenge. And, of course, you all have heard of enrichment. Uh, there are several methods of en enrichment. As an um, engineer and uh, material scientist, mass spectroscopy, one of those, those methods. Um, aerodynamics, laser, and uh, gaseous diffusion. Well, of course, one very common method would be centrifuge. The centrifuge are about a foot diameter, about 10 feet uh, tall. And uh, you feed the, this, this gas, um, uranium hexafluoride, into this uh, centrifuge. But the key is that it has to uh, rotate by tens of thousands of uh, RPM. And uh, so uranium-235 is slightly lighter than uranium-238. So that's the key in uh, isotope separation by only 1%, 1.1.5%. 1. 1 so by spinning this at the very high tens of thousands of uh, RPM, that is enough, that 1.5% uh, mass difference is enough to, to separate the uh, uranium. And there are uh, other uh, technical um, aspects of that. But I don't want to go to too much details because that may bore you guys. Uh, so I'll turn that to, to you or to, my, to okay. Professor Heidi. Yeah. Thank yes, you sir. very much. I appreciate it. Right. Uh, Thank you, Mark. You're welcome. Uh, Peter, for giving me the chance to uh, share my ideas regarding the nuclear deal with, uh, with you. Uh, more talk is going to have two uh, major section. One is what was uh, the reason or what were the reasons that made us to go to agreement, both the US and Iran. And also the next part would be my assessment of the content of nuclear deal. Though I would support the deal, but I'm somehow critical of it too. And I would, I would say why. But the first section uh, is basically, to me, the reasons that convinced or rather persuade or forced us to agree with the nuclear uh, agreement or what we call joint comprehensive uh, plan of action. The reasons are, to me, three of them basically made it necessity Two facilitated it, and one encouraging the deal. The three reasons which uh, made it made the diplomacy a necessity are number one, war. Iranian decision makers came to the conclusion that though the possibility of military attacks are low, but still even that low is too high. 2%, 3% of, chance of chances of war still are very high, particularly considering the situation around us. Just look at Afghanistan, look at Iraq, look at uh, Syria, Yemen. Uh, but also, uh, Pakistan is a fragile state too. So we are living in a very unstable and insecure environment. Another war would, would be catastrophe for almost everyone, but mostly for us. Thus, prevention of or elimination of any chances of war was a key factor for, conven for convincing Iranian decision makers to go for a diplomatic solution. But for the American side, Americans concluded, particularly you can find references a lot in these last few months, when Secretary Kerry or President Obama, when they defend the deal and they want to convince the Congress and the American public, 
when they, you see a lot of references to the points which I'm mentioning now. Americans concluded that war cannot convince Iranian to stop their enrichment program. National intelligence estimates of American in 2007 concluded, this is an assessment of 17 agents, 17 uh, intelligence agencies of, uh, of America, that concluded that Iran has uh, stopped working on weaponizing, weaponizing its nuclear program. Of course, my argument is different, but I'm just reporting what they say. Uh, I have an entirely different argument for that. But for the sake of discussion, I just, I just assume that's correct. But they know that there is a debate inside Iran. They know that, again, they reported that if Iran is, has the capability to build a bomb if they want to. If they have not if they have not yet made it, it is because they have not made the decision to do. So a military attack would convince the Iranian that they have to weaponize their program, their nuclear program. Thus, they thought at most any military attack would postpone the Iranian program for a couple of years, and after that, Iran is going to be almost across the political spectrum, is going to be convinced that they have to have the bomb. Thus they thought war is not a solution of the problem. Thus diplomacy was a key factor then to resolve the problem. If war cannot resolve it, then diplomacy uh, is the most important instrument of resolving the issue. Number two is sanctions. Sanctions, Iranian thought, Iranian decision maker, they thought it is hurting Iranian economy. And they have to get rid of the sanctions. People want a better standard of living. They want a better life. And without a uh, resolution of the nuclear issue, the chances of improving the standard of living were really low. Thus, it rather forced us, Iran, to go for a diplomatic resolution of our nuclear program. From the other, on the, from the other side, the Americans thought sanctions, no matter how crippling, is not going to force Iran to capitulate, meaning stopping and reaching uranium. Thus, they thought diplomatic solution is a better way. In fact, once I was having a dinner with a Christian lamp of Sunday times, she asked me, can you take me to a place in Tehran that I see the impact of the sanctions. I told her, if you expect me to, to, to take you to a store which the shelves are empty, or people are jumping at the top of one another to get food, such a place doesn't exist in Iran. But by no means I'm implying that the sanctions are not impacting the life of people. Yes, it has not made us desperate. We cannot dismiss or ignore the impact of sanctions. And to me, American administration rightly concluded that sanctions cannot force Iran to capitulation. Thus, they both, because of different reasons, thought diplomatic solution is a better way. Issue number three, which rather Made, it, made the diplomacy a necessity to, a necessity to, was what I call lack of alternative, a lack of attractive alternative. What was the realistic alternative if we didn't have the deal? I mean, I just had an interview with 
uh, in Iran Premier at the United States Institute of Peace. Please read that one. I have answered in a more detailed way this question. Uh, it was published, I guess, a few days ago. Uh, but to put it briefly, uh, alternatives were basically more sanction from the US part. And Iranian would have operationalized the two, uh, the 1400 centrifuges of, its, of their second generation, which is far more sophisticated than the first generation. More sanctions, Iranian would have put more effort to operationalize Iraq reactor, heavy water reactor. More sanctions would have forced Iran to go for enriching at a high level of 60 to 65%. And more stockpile of enriched uranium. And after two years, we would have come back. Iranians would have suffered in, this, in the next two years. But we are talking with a much more nuclear capable Iran. Exactly what happened 10 years ago. You know, at that time we had less than 200 centrifuges in, 2000, in 2004, 3 and 4 and 5, when we wanted to have the deep. We did not have, uh, I guess, less than 100 kilograms of a stockpile of enriched uranium. We had not, at the time, enriched up to 20% uranium, and Iraq was almost in a very, very primitive stage. But after all those sanctions, what happened? We suffered a lot in the last 10 years, but you were negotiating with Iran, which was more, far more nuclear capable. And that's exactly what's going to happen in two years from now. Thus, lack of a good alternative forced both of us to adopt diplomacy as the main instrument of resolution of uh, the nuclear, pro nuclear uh, program or nuclear problem. But two other factors were very critical. And these two other factors basically <coughs> facilitated uh, the diplomatic resolution of the problem. One is what I call uh, momentum. momentum. Momentums usually often are not made. They just come. No one can plan to have the momentum. And that momentum was created when we had the election, presidential election in Iran. No one could have predict, predicted the type of things which happened. And President Rouhani could win the election in the first round. So a momentum was created at that time. And thanks God, both administration here and there were very careful to use this momentum. They were conscious of the momentum. Rouhani in his campaign has, uh, has said, or did say, if centrifuges are running or spinning, so should the life of the people. So he had a sort of mandate to do it. And it was far easier for President Obama and Secretary Dehri to deal with Rouhani and Zarif rather than Jalili and Ahmadinejad. So that momentum was very critical. And the next things which facilitated the, uh, the diplomatic resolution was the presence of two teams at the same time this time in both countries who wanted the deal and had the capability and confidence to go for the deal. There were times that the Iranian were ready, but the US administration were not. And there were times which US administration was ready and Iranians were not ready for any sorts of a deal. But this time, they both, both administrations wanted the deal. So these two factors facilitated the process. They were not necessary, but still facilitated. And the last one, I, I called it, you know, it basically encouraged the deal. It was not by any means necessary, but it encouraged the deal. And that's what I say, uh, the regional issues. 
Our friends were not in a good conditions in the region. Hezbollah, Hamas, Iraq, with a problem in Afghanistan. So we just wanted to get rid of the nuclear issue to concentrate on resolution of this problem. Of course, I have a long discussion about this issue, which hopefully will come on 14th of this month by Atlantic Council, which I have addressed the uh, regional implication of the deal. So in the question and answer part, I can go briefly about some of these points, but allow me to come back to my own discussion until the question and answer part, and you can go to that uh, publication which is going to come out uh, on 14th of this month. But for the Americans, Americans, you know, of the many, uh, arguably many years of debate, concluded that, you know, China is a rising power, and the major challenges is going rightly, is going to come from China in the next 20, 25 years. No more. Yes, Middle East is very important, but comparing with the whole Middle East, but China is still is, is just nothing, you know, in terms of economy, in terms of, uh, in terms of the weapons, I mean, the weaponry uh, and Chinese uh, military capabilities. In 10 years, possibly China is going to be the number one economy in the world, outpacing the Americans. Thus, American writer concluded that they have to go for what, I, what we call offshore balancing, meaning balancing China basically by Navy and Air Force principally, and by basically making a coalition of Australian, Japanese, South Korean, and, and Indian. So American, if they want to reduce, not eliminate, reduce their presence in the Middle East, they just, they just wanted to be sure Iran is not going to be a spoiler. Thus, regional issue basically uh, was, uh, was uh, sort of important incentives for both Iran and the US uh, to go for the diplomatic resolution of the problem. But that was my first section of my talk. Let me go to the second section quickly. Promise to finish very quickly. <laughs> The second one is the way we would look at, because there are a lot of discussion here in Washington, you know, about the deal that this is a good deal or a bad deal, you know. I have divided the views in Iran to four major groups. One is the group which unconditionally would support the deal. They're tired of uh, the economy, they are tired of the standard of living, they are tired of, you know, almost everything, they want a deal, and they don't care about the content of the deal. What they want is just a deal, is the agreement. Group number two are people like me. I am critical of the deal, but I still I support the deal. Not on the basis of what was given and what was taken, but rather on the basis of its strategic achievements, which is not in the deal itself, but these are consequences of the deal. Number three are those who have legitimate concerns about the deal, but they oppose the deal. And number four are the group who oppose it no matter what. Their opposition is unconditional. They don't want the deal, basically. And if they use our excuses, the excuses are just excuses for rejecting the deal. They don't want a deal. You know, they say we, don't, we cannot trust the Americans, you know, just look at the past behavior. And some of them basically is a habit. They get used to this hostile relationship. A reward structure exists in both Washington and Tehran, and in Riyadh and Tel Aviv, which reward the hostile relationship. And they're benefiting from this hostility. Just, they don't want to deal. But some others, they're not benefiting. But rather, they, they, have, they get used to it as a habit. They feel comfortable. They're suffering, but still they're comfortable with the suffering. It is a known territory rather than a big change with a lot of unknown 
things which would bring, uh, which may bring to their life. That's why these people would oppose it. But let me go then to uh, my assessment of the deal, content of the deal, for a, for a few minutes. You know, I have developed four criteria for assessment. Number one criteria is timing. By timing, I mean if you are giving, for, if you are giving cash, you should demand for cash. If you are accepting promises, you should give promises. Cash for cash, promises for promises. But if you go through all, 900, all 159 pages of this comprehensive uh, agreement, you would see that basically there is an imbalance, disproportionality with, in, in the timing of the deal. For instance, just give you an example. You know, Iran should give, should stop or remove 2,000 centrifuges from Fordue nuclear site, which is deep in the mountains, and no one can hit it, destroy it, except the Americans. So we should remove those 2,000 centrifuges first. We have to remove about, about 12, 13,000 centrifuges from Natanz plant. We have to dilute almost about 11,000 plus kilograms of enriched uranium. We have to transform the heart of Iraq reactor. And we have to respond to a number of questions by, by IAEA called PMDs, possible military dimension questions. Once we did all of those, then IAEA would verify that we have done it, then sanctions can be lifted. So what if we do all of those things and IAEA, so IAEA, IAEA do not approve or do not verify what we have done? What if US Congress pass a law and say prevent the president, veto-proof law, and prevent the president to lift the sanctions. So to me, that's not the right way to make a deal. I would have not done it that way. What I would have done was, basically, I take 2,000 centrifuges from Fordue, you have to lift these sanctions. I take another 5,000 centrifuges in Natanz, then you have to lift this sanction. Reciprocal, step by step, deal. Thus, in terms of timing, it is very much into the disadvantage of Iran. It is not cash for cash, promise for promise. Number two is what I call strategic weight of what was given and what was taken. If somehow we can quantify what was given and what was taken, to me, what was taken by US for sure would outweigh that what was given. I don't expect 50-50, because after all, Iran is a medium level power and is negotiating with six great power, including its superpower. That would not be rational or wise of us to ask for 50-50. Even 37% was not met. 30 to 7, 70. 70 the six power, 30 on the Iranian part. Of course, in a book which I have written, which is going to come out hopefully in a couple of months from now, and as in Farsi, I have done a detailed study of what was given and what was taken. But in general, I'm not all that much concerned. My main criticism, it is not because of a strategic weight of what was given and what was taken. But the next or the third criteria is what I call strategic composition of what was taken and what, what was given. And by that I mean, 
you know, personally, I would have preferred three, only three cascades of second generation centrifuges to enrich uranium at Fordue and giving up Natanz and Iraq altogether. These 5,000 centrifuges, the three cascades is about 900, about 492 uh, uh, number of centrifuges. Three multiplied by 164. So I would have preferred that 490 plus centrifuges to these 5,000 centrifuges. And reaching uranium in Fordue rather than in Natanz. But American had some specific guidelines and what, they, what was given and taken on their part had and has a strategic coherency, which is a very key word. And what I mean by that is basically, you know, they conclude that there are four pathways to bombs. They closed on all four pathways. Concept number two, which guided the negotiation, was what they call detection. Being able to detect our compliance or our cheating. And there is a robust verification system in place to detect the compliance or non-compliance and the cheating. So that's why you, we have such a kind of a robust verification system there. Concept number three is basically break out or sneak out. Break out means from the time Iran decides non-compliance or cheating to the time we have enough fissile material for one bomb. Not the real bomb, but just only the fissile material. It may take a long time after that to, I mean, to make a bomb. They wanted one year to be between the time we decide and the time we have enough, enough fissile material. And this is subject of or function of three factors. Type of centrifuges, number of centrifuges, and a stockpile of enriched uranium. They said if you want to have more centrifuges, find you have to reduce the stockpile. If you have a more stockpile, then you have to reduce the number of centrifuges. Not only that, but they limited, they limited the type of centrifuges which, we can, which can enrich uranium. They limited it only to the very primitive, what we call primitive first generation centrifuges. <coughs> so that breakout time should be one year. For that, thus, we cannot have anything more than 300 kilograms of enriched uranium for the entire life of the agreement. And also, uh, basically, uh, for next 10 years, we are going to be limited to the first generation of, uh, first generation of centrifuges. And uh, this is going to be, and, uh, and also they are going to close down the sneak out path as well, as well by inspecting regime. And the concept number, number four is deterrence. They just want to deter Iranian to make a decision to cheat or to go for non-compliance. There are a number of them. Snapback basically is the very uh, reason for the snapback to be there is basically because of deterring Iran. And I'm sure a number of laws are going to be passed in the US Congress uh, to deter us. Thus, you see, there is a strategic coherency uh, for what was given and, and what was taken from the, from the American side. But I don't see that. I don't see that strategic coherency from our side, unfortunately. And the criteria number four is, so number one was timing, strategic weight, strategic composition, and number four is what I call reversibility and irreversibility. Reversible for irreversible, irreversible for irreversible. 
with the idea of the snapback and with the ease of bringing back the sanctions to a large extent, I don't, I don't want to say it totally. I mean, sanctions can, be, can come back relatively quickly. Although in practice it is going to be far difficult and in Iran I would argue it is difficult in reality to bring, bring many of the sanctions back. But for us, you know, if you dilute it, you enrich uranium, you just cannot reconstitute it again soon. It is almost irreversible. Iraq, the same thing. If you transform the nature of our Iraq reactor, it is almost impossible to reverse it. Thus, in terms of the reversibility, irreversibility, again, it is not in Iran's advantage. Thus, in general, to me, America got a good deal. And those who are criticizing the deal, I have seen very few of them concentrate on the content of the deal. But rather, it is mostly strategic consequences of the deal that they are opposing, that like Iranian regional behavior. But that's, in fact, the very reason that I support the deal. I support the deal not because of the content, because, I, as I said, to me, the content is very much disproportionately in the benefits and advantage of the American. Even the most hawks, which I used to talk before, before the deal, they were satisfied with the content of the deal. But I think what we are going to gain from the deal is strategic advantages which is going to accompany, hopefully, the deal, which is not inside the deal itself. Like desecuratization of Iran. Iran was successfully securitized under Iranian former President Ahmadinejad. America was able to convince critical audiences in the world that Iran's nuclear program is a danger for peace and security of the world. Thus, we have a number of UN Security Council resolutions. So to me, it is important that as if that would be the first step toward desecuritization. In other words, we will be no longer perceived as a danger for the peace and security of the world. It is very different from the region. The terrorism is basically a regional issue. It is not a global issue. Our support for Hezbollah or Hamas is, is a sort of regional. And never, basically, America was never able to make the terrorism as a threat to global peace and security. But the nuclear issue was exactly the opposite. They were able to do it. So to me, it would be good for Iran, basically, to move toward desecuratization. America is the most important securitizing actor. Having a deal with Iran would pave the way, hopefully, for desecuritization of Iran. And then we would move, after this phase, toward normalization of the relationship, which would be extremely important again for Iran. And then we would find time to, in other words, to go for the stabilization of the region. We are facing a lot of threat in the region, a lot of threat from insecurity and instability. And number four, of course, is, which is in the deal, is about the sanctions. We will have a better chance of improving the life of the people. So these are the main reasons to me that, you know, the, the, for me to defend the deal, not realistically the content of what was given and what was taken. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So my comments uh, uh, build off of uh, the point where um, Nasser left us. 
And I should say, my name is Peter Fever. I'm a professor of political science and public policy here at Duke. There's a very wide consensus in the US national security expert community, and there's a very, very few outliers to this consensus. Um, the consensus is that, that our problems are with the Iranian regime, not with the Iranian people. That in the long run, with a different regime, we could expect friendly relations with the Iranian people. And our quest, the US uh, policy community's quest since 1979, has been uh, for a moderate regime elements uh, that would better align with the interests of the Iranian people, as we would see it, and also better align with American interests. And uh, successive administrations have gone on this quest for the moderate is, um, Iranian leader. It's a little bit like the quest for the Yeti or a quest for the extraterrestrial. It's led uh, some, regime, uh, some administrations to do crazy things, like the birthday cake uh, uh, that the Reagan administration sent. So the, but that consensus is built on the notion that we do not have a fundamental argument with the Iranian people. Our dispute is with the Iranian regime. And that leads to a very stable foreign policy platform. Um, and that platform is that the regional and global interests of the Iranian hardliner regime runs counter to US interests in many, though not all, respects. And so there'll be occasional temporary overlap. And where there is, we can take a very transactional coordination, as happened, say, on Afghanistan in the immediate aftermath of 9-11, the fall of 2001, spring of 2002. There can be transactional cooperation like that. But until there's fundamental change in the orientation of the regime, the conflicts of interest will overlap and eclipse. I should say the con conflicts of interest will eclipse the overlap in interest. But Within that consensus, there are, there's room for debate. And one of the debates uh, is the one that, that you referenced. Is President Rouhani a genuine moderate? Is he the long searched for moderate uh, leader? Or is he a stalking horse of the hardliners? Is he, when he disappoints, is that because he's constrained by hardliners? Or when he disappoints, is that because he's revealing his true colors? Those are debated inside the, within this consensus. More importantly, and for the, our purposes today, even within this consensus, you can still have different views about the utility of the, the Iran nuclear deal. And in particular, the utility of the Iran nuclear deal in its larger regional implications. So set aside the, the narrow questions of, is this, is this a good deal on its, on its terms? Is this the best deal the US could have gotten, if we had had better negotiating strategy, could we have gotten better terms? There's a lively debate among experts on that. Set aside that, let's just focus on the implications for the broader region, which is where you left off. And there's three views among American policymakers. There's the optimists, the pessimists, and the skeptics. And the, optimi oh, sorry, the optimists said that perhaps an Iranian regime that is willing to cut the nuclear deal is signaling that it wants to come in from the cold, that it wants a more cooperative relations generally, and perhaps the extensive interactions that the US diplomatic community now have had with Iranian counterparts, which had not been the case up until this uh, negotiations, this will create momentum that will sort of spill over from the, uh, the nuclear deal into broader regional cooperation. And that's the optimist's position. The pessimists say, we cannot confront Iran adequately on all of the other range of issues where we have conflicts of interest with the regime, not with the Iranian people, but with the regime. We cannot confront those concerns while the nuclear issue is hanging. And so what we have to do is we have to put the nuclear issue in a box. We have to settle the nuclear issue. And that will free up the policy bandwidth, the, uh, 
the opportunity to address the other concerns that we have with Iranian behavior. And we make no optimistic assumptions about how cooperation on the nuclear deal will lead to cooperation on others. Quite the contrary, we expect Iran to perhaps compensate for uh, whatever perceived concessions they made on the nuclear deal, ramping up in the other areas where their interests conflict with ours. Uh, but having dealt with the nuclear issue, put it in a box, that frees us up to take more robust efforts on these others. And those are the pessimists. And then there's the skeptics. The skeptics say that a good nuclear deal might be worth having, but this is not a good nuclear deal. This deal gives up way too much, and it empowers the Iranian regime in ways adverse to U.S. interests. So the momentum that will come from the deal uh, is negative momentum, and it will be, uh, it'll make all of the rest of the, the nuclear, sorry, all of the rest of the Iranian file more difficult to manage. And that's the skeptic's position. So optimists, there are some uh, regional experts outside the administration who are in the optimist camp. And inside the Obama administration, it tends to be the political people who are in the optimist camp. Uh, ben Rhodes has made these kinds of, of comments. He's the communicator for the White House. There's a question mark about whether where Secretary Kerry would be, whether he's in the optimist or the pessimist. It's unclear. In the pessimists camp, most of the regional experts inside the administration are pessimists. And most of those who were the subject matter experts and the diplomats responsible for designing the negotiations were in the pessimist camp. And when they would sell the negotiations to the rest of the expert community, they would assure the rest of the experts, they were pessimists. They were not uh, addressing all of the concerns that we have with Iran. This was going to be a very narrowly tailored deal that would narrowly address the nuclear issue, put it in a box, and allow the rest of the administration, uh, uh, rest of the concerns to be addressed. Indeed, we had here at Duke last January, February, Jake Sullivan, who was one of the first people to begin the negotiations with Iran, back when it was secret negotiations. And in his public talk, he emphasized that the nuclear deal was very narrowly circumscribed. At that point, we didn't have the final parameters, but the logic that he uh, described, uh, I think he would stand by today, that the, that the per nuclear deal was narrowly described and narrowly uh, defined, and that would leave the U.S. in a better position to confront all of the other issues on which Iran's interests conflict with the U.S. And then the skeptics, uh, most of the Republicans and some of the Democrats, uh, particularly in the Senate, um, ha are in the skeptics camp. So the key question, I, who I haven't identified or haven't placed in a box, is President Obama. He's the most important voice on this, and it's unclear, depending which audience he talks to, uh, and depending who's describing his views, you'll find him in one or the other uh, box. It's definitely not the skeptics, but is he an optimist? Is he a pessimist? It's unclear. Uh, since the deal is signed, there hasn't been much evidence for the optimists to brag about. I think the pessimists and the skeptics have had more uh, things to point to to say, see, this is why our position about the nuclear deal is right. The pessimists still defend the deal, but they say, for all these reasons, we, ha we need the nuclear deal so that we can be better positioned to confront Iran. The crucial question, and this is the debate between pessimists and skeptics, is can the deal be honored and the U.S. side of the deal honored, while also confronting Iran on all of the rest of the issues, support for terrorism, support for regional instability, support for Assad, et cetera, et cetera, can the U.S. do everything it needs to do or feels it needs to do on those other issues without 
undermining the deal? Does the, uh, the terms of the deal require that the U.S. not take steps, for instance, not impose sanctions based on terrorism rather than on, on nuclear issues? So far, the Iranian uh, leaders have not done much to help the pessimists, let alone help the optimists, make their case. There, we haven't seen much of a change, of course, on Iraq, the positions on Iraq. The uh, most important concession, which was allowing Maliki to step down, was made well before. And since then, there hasn't been much progress. There hasn't been any progress on Syria. Uh, and the, it bears emphasizing that the, the, the picture of human suffering that we've seen in, vividly on display on, in TV and photographs, those are refugees from the civil war that Assad is inflicting upon the Syrian people. And Assad is funded and armed by the Iranians. And third, the, the uh, rhetoric coming from the uh, Iranian leadership uh, is still very problematic. Understand that some of that may just be uh, domestic consumption, and yet it's still concerning. Which leaves the one other thing that Iran could do to help, which is to faithfully and fully implement the terms of the nuclear deal. That's the only one that still seems plausible at this stage. I think the other things I described that Iran could do, very few people are convinced they'll do it. So that leaves the question, uh, who will be proved right? The optimists, the pessimists, or the skeptics? And at least as of September 8, 2015, I think that's still very much a jump ball. So with that, I think I'll give you a chance, to, if you want to say anything, a few words. just a few words, and then we'll open up to, to, to Q&A. Okay. Uh, so the way I, the, I, I, I discuss is not fundamentally different from yours, because the first group in Iran, which I said that the reaction toward the deal, what I said, those who would, who would support the deal unconditionally is basically your optimist group. Those people who, like me, are critical but supported the deal are your pessimist group, basically. In other words, our argument that the point is even President Obama, Secretary Kerry, they defend the deal on the basis of the principle of, of pessimism which you laid out. Meaning, in other words, they said that, okay, this is, we are only concentrated on the nuclear issue. Regional issues are extremely important, but they have to be addressed in other ways. But unfortunately, what would happen, what some of, uh, what some, some of the things which we say in Iran, meaning Zarif, Rouhani, or others, they can be used here by the hardliner to sabotage the deal. And the same thing is happening here. What, in fact, some of the words of Secretary Kerry or President Obama uh, says, I know to a large extent it is for domestic audiences, but I still, you know, the hardliners in Iran would use those words. You know, when Secretary Kerry or White House spokesman says, you know, we are better off with a deal because the inspectors are going to know about the detail of the nuclear program. They would know about the targets that in future if you, I mean, right now, if you, want to, if you want to attack Iran, you know, they have only two to three months to bomb, to fissile materials. But 15 years from now, they are a year from the bomb. And also, we have a much better knowledge from their capability through inspections. And also we have, uh, we know the targets much better, which target should be hidden. So that's not good. The other side is reading. They are reading also this stuff. Same thing, the type of stuff we say in Iran. So the hardliners in both capitals, and also in Tel Aviv and Riyadh, they are using these arguments of the other sides to sabotage the deal. So to me, the pessimist, or what I call the critical supporter of the deal, they have to be careful. In other words, they have to, they have to be not in a shy fool to defend the deal. 
and not to buy the type of arguments uh, uh, or not to basically use the type of arguments which may convince some voters, which may convince some of the senators or congressmen or, or in our case, majlis, uh, that may hurt basically at the end of the day it may hurt. Thus, uh, I would love to address, I mean I would come back to this address about the Afghanistan Syria because I guess our, our interest in Afghanistan and Iraq is very similar and we are already coordinating and cooperating on those issues. Syria is a different, but I wait, I wait for a few minutes for the answer for the answer at question park, and then I would address these issues. Good, so if you have a question, just catch my eye, and I'll call on you, sir. First a comment, uh, Peter, I think the Iranian people have no problem with the American community. It has been with the American administration. I guess there's a conclusion of Proud-Rice mixed themes when I was special on Iran. Uh, I, I think uh, the one strategic impact is a subtle shift in American public opinion about Israel and uh, an end of the unlimited blank check, no questions asked policy. I don't even know if our leaders realize it, but a lot. I think that, that there's a subtle shift there, and certainly we don't want Israel to make its own decision. Um, but I wonder what was the role of the other superpowers in making the deal? That's kind of my question. The role of the other superpowers, how did they facilitate or how did they do that? Okay. Yeah. Of course, we don't have any other superpower. <laughs> oh, I'm supposed to repeat the uh, the question. Was the question, just for the microphone, question was, what was the role of the other superpowers, not the United States, but the other other great powers, shall we say, uh, and what were their interests and how did they shape the deal? Uh, they all basically support the deal, but one was surprising to me, and that was Russia. For the rest, uh, I thought they would do, because that's their inter interest. Europeans' interests are in a better deal. They want to be sure they have access to Iran, and they want to. And Iran is a secure place. They were worried if, if anything happens, you know, that can further destabilize the region, and that would not be in, in anyone's interest. Thus, they wanted the deal. Same thing with China. China, you know, has invested a lot in Iran. They wanted to be secure. They want to be sure about the. Uh, about the oil, you know, the passage of oil, the production of the oil. Um, they have a lot of economic interest and also the security interest. Thus, they wanted a deal too. But the only country which I thought may oppose the deal was Russia. And that's mostly due, due to geopolitical reason than economic reason. There was some economic reason, like Iranian oil coming to market, or Iranian gas coming to market, and to go to the Europe and then we may have a sort of a competition uh, with the Russians, but I still that was very much secondary. The primary reason was geopolitical reasons. After all, if you are sitting in, in Kremlin and looking at the Middle East, you see that your enemies are engaged with one another. U.S. is very much engaged and bogged down, you know, in, in the Middle East, with, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Syria to some extent, and basically in, with Iran. Iran, the same thing, is engaged with all of these countries, and we, are, we don't have that much to concentrate in Chechnya or Dagestan. U.S. does not have that much resources to allocate to what, what's happening in, inside, inside Russia regarding the human rights or in uh, Crimea or in uh, Ukraine or whatever. In other words, if U.S. had a freer hand, would have been much more vocal about what happened in Ukraine, much more vocal about what happened in Crimea or what is happening in Russia. Same thing, like, like, same thing as Iran. I mean, if we were not all that involved, our relations would have been different in, in not only Dagestan, Chechnya, but also in Turkmenistan and other areas. Thus, to me, that was surprising why Russian, I, would, I really would like to know why Russian supported the deal and did not create impediment uh, for the deal. Jason. What are the physics behind So the question for those on live stream was what uh, was to the specifics of the, the, the deal for the heavy water reactor and what, what does the deal do for the heavy water reactor? 
Okay, so heavy water is for plutonium, as you probably know, light water for um, uranium-235. Plutonium is easier to produce and is one of the byproducts of actually nuclear power, power plants. So, um, and we heard it today in the news that um, Iran has given up the um, uh, production of heavy water uh, nuclear uh, facilities. If, uh, if, that's you correct, so. if you have to transform it yeah. uh, to, a, to a top of a reactor which would produce much, much, much lower uh, plutonium, which is another way for the bomb. In other words, it is almost impossible to build enough plutonium by, this, by, the, by, the, by, the, by the design of this new reactor to produce plutonium for the, for the bomb. Is that it? That answers the question? In part, yeah. can you speak more to the physics of enriching plutonium and what that process looks like? Is it a so unfortunately, I have some layout. Uh, I could show you after the, sure. yeah, I'll, I'll show okay, you. Thank you, sir. Yeah. So I, I wonder if, oh, uh, okay, so I, have a I guess we will call on the provost, the former uh, provost. Yes. Um, <laughs> I'm thinking, I'm thinking of the opposition where the real root lies. And it seems to me, in both sides, it has to do not with the current situation, but with the expected or predicted or hoped for or, or feared behavior of future administrations. So if you take the optimists, the pessimists, and the skeptics, between us, the pessimists and the skeptics, So the question was, what are the skeptics uh, complaining about? Maybe all they're complaining about is future agreement, uh, future behavior of future administrations rather than the, the current ones. Uh, the skeptics' argument would be, and I'll invite you to add on to this, the, the U.S. skeptic uh, argument is, uh, has a little bit more to it than you just suggested. The skeptic would say the administration mishandled the negotiations. The, the broad strategic framework of use the, the stick of, of coercive sanctions and the carrot of face-to-face -face negotiations, that was laid down by the Bush administration and the, and the Obama administration just continued. So at that, the idea of negotiating with the Iranians, that's not what the, uh, the skeptics would say. The skeptics would say the, the Obama administration squandered the first three years, 2009 to 2012, were slow to embrace the uh, ratcheting up of the sanctions, actually tried to block the congressionally imposed sanctions, failed to take advantage of the, the, the opportunity for ratcheted up sanctions that the, the Green um, uh, revolution mm -hmm. movement of June 2009, failed to take advantage of the Fordow revelations of September 2009, delayed it for several months, failed to take advantage of other things that were going on that were slowing down the Iranian 
uh, progress. So during that critical window when ratcheted up pressure could have been levied, did not, uh, did not uh, ratchet up. Then once negotiations were started, made the administration made it clear that they ha saw no alternative to a deal, that they, they could not imagine leaving without a deal, that they had to get a deal because the alternative was war and nobody wants war. And so that violates sort of diplomacy one-on-one. -on -one. You don't go into a deal and make it clear that you want this deal so bad you can't imagine leaving it. And even when the Iranians presented them with golden opportunities to do that, for instance, at the very end when the Russians and the Iranians added in the uh, question about the ballistic missiles and the conventional arms embargo, that would have been a golden opportunity for the administration to say, we want a deal, but we're going to walk away. You, come, you call us when you're serious, because we've got the broad terms of the deal. You've got, we're not going to make that concession. And, and even then, the administration didn't do it. They made a concession that shocked some of their own supporters. So what was the deal that they, the, the, the skeptics wanted? A much more draconian deal, one that would have been even more painful for him to, uh, to accept. On the grounds that that the uh, that the international community had had the whip hand and should have gotten it. Now, once the deal is made, the concessions that the U.S. have made are irreversible. They've made an irreversible concession on the legitimacy to uh, enrich. That had been a consensus enshrined in U.N. Security Council resolutions that that Iran would not get that, and it wasn't just a symbolic concession, which is what I think most skeptics thought. The deal would result with the Iranians having some symbolic right to, to uh, enrich. Instead, they get an industrial-sized enrichment capacity. The, the sanctions, the, the sanction, no, no, it's industrial-sized today, in part because the, de, it, the, the delay uh, in, in the size, thousands of enrichment, and growing even more unlimited after the 15 years. They, that's the other thing they're worried about was the short term, only 15 years. And then the snapback sanctions. The snapback sanctions has a clever mechanism in it that allowed, which, and what I'd really like to know is what was the deal that got the Russians to go along with the exactly. mechanism that allows for the snapback. But the snap, but sanctions uh, have three components to it. They have the legal component, which snaps back. They have the institutional infrastructure component, which doesn't snap back and they have the political will component to implement the legal uh, sanctions, and that, that doesn't snap back. Moreover, the snapback sanctions are undermined by the poison pill, which, set, which contained in the JCPOA says, if sanctions are reimposed, then the deal is null and void, and Iran is no longer bound.